In 1830, Constant Pennancy, an Algonquin chief, complained to the British that there were incursions on his hunting territory. The incursion was the building of the Rideau Canal and the birth of Bytown, the forerunner of Ottawa. Constant moved away and generations of settlers began moving in. I found my love by the timber side. I dreamed a dream by the Rideau Canal. Kiss my girl by the sawmill wall in old by town in old by town what smoke is drifting across the moon shiners prowling on their beat springs a girl in the street at night in old by town in old by town i heard a whistle from the government dog saw a train set the night on fire smelled the spring in the snowy wind in old by town in old by town they're gonna take a big sharp axe shining steel tempered in the fire they're gonna chop them all down like one big dead old tree in old by town that's your bit in old by town i found my girl by the timber slide i dreamed a dream by the rideau canal I kiss my girl by the sawmill wall in old by town in old by town you're on your own in Now we've got you in good voice. As Ben said, we're starting way back. This is the Champlain Sea. Uh, this is maybe uh, eight or 9,000 years ago. Um, as you can see, there's Ottawa. And we're under 300 feet of Ottawa, uh, of water. We're under 300 feet of water. Uh, how do we know this? Because uh, in eight, 1955, at the Foster Sand Pit, they found beluga bones. When they were digging for Uplands Airport, they found ring-tailed seal bones. And in Vanier, at Odell's Brickyard, they also found some beluga bones. So had we gone outside t uh, eight or 9,000 years ago, we'd have been under 300 feet of water looking up and seeing some belugas and ring-tailed seals going on. Then. This part, the Frontenac Arch, broke and so developed, the water drained into the Great Lakes and so developed um, the St. Lawrence and then the Ottawa. The Ottawa rivers appeared. Um, so that was the birth. This is uh, by uh, Thomas Davis uh, in 1791. This is the Shorty Air Falls, and he's showing some nat and there's some natives across here with the canoe. Um, as you know, this is a, this is a sacred spot for the Anish Anishinaabeg. Um, the 
the Shorty Air Falls and the Rideau, and uh, they also by the uh, Juliana Apartments, uh, where there's faults that appeared as the land rose. So here we have the Shorty Air Falls. Um, as I say, it's nobody's fault. Ha <laughs> ha. And um, you can groan if you wish, please. <laughs> There'll be many or more opportunities. <laughs> uh, um, the, the sooner or later, with that kind of kinetic power, and with the Europeans on the move, there was going to be a settlement here. If you've got kinetic power at that level, if you think about the model for most uh, Canadian, Eastern Canadian villages, you've got river hills and some sort of kinetic power. So sooner or later, as we will see, there's going to be a, uh, a settlement here. Now, these are, these are Anishinaabeg. Algonquins as we know them. Champlain actually gave them the name Algonquin, the people who are dancing. The what I'm going to be looking at in these three lectures is the notion of how the attitude towards land has evolved in a Canadian way, which is why I took that one acre and look, used it as a microscope slide to sort of look into it. So we start with land, when there was no one here. Then we have territory, which is the native. Then we have property, which is the French, from proper to own. And finally, the British real estate. So that's how we're sort of looking at it. And I'm taking Ottawa in this gorgeous setting that it has as a sort of stage for the evolution of those four parts. Now, if we go back to the, the Anishinaabe attitude towards land, theirs is based on a system of enough. If you have enough land with your trap lines to feed your family, why would you need more? It doesn't make sense. Of course, we operate on a completely uh, different system in that the more land you have, the wealthier and there, in some cases, the, uh, the more royal you must be. <laughs> uh, so that whole idea of accumulating land doesn't work with them. And you can't own it. You are the steward of it. And we're seeing that clash even now. Um, as as the uh, as the uh, the process of reconciliation evolves, and so this this concept of not of being able to own land and not needing more than you can actually have, they had they had extended families. If if my brother died, then his family became part of my family. Now, do we have any evidence? of the Anishinaabe in the area. We don't have it so far, never say never, we don't have it so far on the south side, on, on our side, on the Ottawa side, but there is evidence over at Lac Um I, I spent a week there uh, working on the dig with uh, Ian from the NCC, and to my delight, <laughs> This is uh, Joseph. He, uh, he's a 16-year-old from Kitigan Zibi. And he is, in a sense, rediscovering his own culture. When I met him, he had a, he had a couple of arrowheads in his pocket that he was taking home. <laughs> uh, but So probably not a permanent settlement over at Lac Limi, but a meeting place in the spring right about now, where they would barter, uh, trade goods back and forth, and um, mingle, find a mate if they could, um, just like spring, party, spring break that we have. Um, <laughs> and the, the, the thing to remember also that in, in his culture, in his spiritual culture, the spirit of, uh, hi, the spirit, the spirit yes. of um, 
the spirit of an attitude towards the land, which is what I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about here, the spirit of that is in the land. Forgive me, but the Christian attitude tends to work on the idea, if you remember when we went, those of you that went to Sunday school, that God was sort of this absentee landlord, <laughs> in a sense. That, well, but if you, put, if you put the spirit into the land, does it make a difference to how you look after it? Does it make a difference to how you look after it? And I think that's something worth inheriting from these, uh, from these people like Joseph, these, these Anish, Anish Narbeg. Um, so we're, we're going to be seeing that as well. Now, I'm going to jump forward a little bit. This is, d d does anybody recognize this? Yes, it's the statue that used to be at the foot of Champlain's statue on the Pian Point. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but they're in the middle of the moment of uh, giving a do-over to, uh, to the Pian Point. I kind of liked it the way it was. Do you remember the am little amphitheater that was? Yeah. Anyway, that's the history of Ottawa is less music. Um, <laughs> the, um, this, this statue, uh, it, it irked the, Algon the Algonquins. So first of all, Champlain was about close to three times the size of him. So the colonizer is three times bigger than the, than the native. Um, and he's looking out upriver, whereas Champlain was looking at his astrolabe, um, and he's holding it upside down, by the way. I don't know if you know that, but he's actually holding it upside down in the statue. So if he takes a reading, he's in Tierra del Fuego. <laughs> <laughs> but this gentleman, I'm asking to stand in for a gentleman by the name of Pierre Louis Constant Penance. Pierre Louis Con Pen Constant Penance, who used to spend his summers down at the uh, uh, at Oka at the Lac de les Deux Montagnes, uh, but he would come up, and his trap lines were south of o of the Ottawa River at the Chaudière. So, and in fact. We're on his hunting territory, his trapping, his trapping territory. How do we know this? He writes a note, well, he dictates a note, en français, to the, um, I'm sorry, but they were called then the Indian agent, saying that there are incursions on his land and its effect, this is in 1830, that's why I'm jumping forward a little bit. He, there are incursions on his land and the incursions are Colonel Bai. And it's affecting his hunting. A little later on, about six or seven years later, he goes down with another chief. By the way, he got promoted from chief to grand chief by the British and was given, yeah, I know, he, he even got a sort of certificate saying that he'd been promoted, which uh, is, um, a piece of daring on behalf of the British that <laughs> I'm sure he didn't appreciate very much. Um, but uh, he, he went down to Montreal with another chief, and he said he didn't do the classic sort of, could you please all get off my land, because it's not his land. He simply asks for hunting territory, somewhere to put his trap lines, somewhere else. He just simply wants to move. He can no longer feed his family. There's this settlement starting, and it's affecting his trap lines. Can he move? Um, and in the library, in, as again, it was called uh, Indian Affairs at the time, I found him about 50 or 60 years later up in Burnstown. He was actually given some, uh, some more land <coughs> up, up there. Okay, At the bottom of his... Uh, he would sign all these letters that, that were written on his behalf with a picture of a partridge. It was his, cl it was his clan sign. Mm. It was just a little partridge. Penance means partridge. And you're seeing it, one of the stations, one of the LRT stations, is Penace, which is a bastardization of his name. And I think that's, I'm hoping that's why they picked it. Um, so I, what I would like to happen is that this statue, which is now in Majors Hill Park, actually has 
Pierre Louis Constant Penancy <laughs> written around the, the bottom of it. But he, if you think about this man, he's right on the precipice of history. He's born a free man with a hunting territory, which was about 10 miles square. And he ends up having to ask for a pension 50 miles from where he, uh, he had his trap lines and, and, his, and his family. And he ha so he's kind of fallen over into colonization. Okay, so there's territory. <coughs> there's territory. We've gone from land to territory. Now we're going to move into property, the French. This is one of Champlain's maps. He's actually a very good cartographer. This is also a brochure because he's found, he's, he's, it's one of those brochures. He's founding, as you know, Champlain founded uh, Quebec Stratacona. He founded Quebec City. Um, he would use these, and they were printed, and they would go out around Europe for people to come over here, for French to come over here, because they needed to populate Nouvelle France. And we can see, forgive me, we can see, here's the St. Lawrence, and then here he's going up the Ottawa River, and he's actually written Algonquin. Sur la carte ici, il a écrit Algonquin. So if we all got up now and walked down to the river and moved the calendar forward to June the 13th, 1613, we would see Champlain coming up the river. He's got a sore hand. He's got a bandage on his hand because as they were going through, he had a go at going through the Lachine Rapids and then gave up. Um, somebody had previously done it, a gentleman called Etienne Brulé, who was probably actually the first European to go past us a few years, early, a few years earlier. The, the Champlain had instituted this system of having uh, sort of trade emissaries, people who could learn in this case, Huron, and then they could negotiate. You can understand if, if th they don't speak the same language, it makes uh, negotiation difficult. So e Etienne was um, a, a young firebrand, actually. Um, Champlain called him a wo womanizer and not a very nice person. But he did actually uh, get the job done. He learned to speak Huron. Um, and he probably was the first European to go to actually go up the Ottawa River and go past this. But here's Champlain on June the 13th, 1613, going past. There's two canoes. In one of the canoes, Champlain loved canoes. As soon as he arrived, he looked over and he went, oh, now why did he find them so interesting? Compared to the, the dories and the rowboats that he'd been using in France. Because you're facing the way you're going. I mean, it made perfect sense to him, you know, why, why am I going backwards when I could go forwards? <laughs> so it, the first thing he did was haul a canoe up on deck when he came w on one of his earlier voyages. So he's canoeing up, and there's an Algonquin in front of him, an Anishinaabeg in front of him, and an Anishinaabeg behind him. At no point, as he's coming up and they disembark and they portage on the far side, there's actually Portage Creek on the, on the whole side, so I've got to go round the short air falls. At no point does Champlain say, how do you guys do things around here? <laughs> he doesn't ask. He doesn't ask because he's here for two reasons. He's working for the hundred merchants, Les saint Marchands. He's working for them, and he's also working for the, for the Catholics. He's, he's, he's harvesting souls because of the conceit that his spirituality and religion is an improvement on the one of the people that he's meeting. If they could speak the other, each other's language, 
if he leant forward and said, by the way, this is now part of New Nouvelle France to the Algonquin, if they could understand each other, by the way, this is part of New Nouvelle France, get out of here. What do you mean? Well, and by the way, where is France? Well, it's about 3,000, uh, how many, I can't do it in leagues, but it's about 3,000 <laughs> miles that way. Can you imagine the, the utter incomprehension that would take place? This is now some part of New, why is it part of Nouvelle France? Because I'm going through it. <laughs> I just described colonization to you. I just described colonization to you. Randy Newman, a great songwriter, read this great big thick book on colonization. And he wanted to get it down to one verse. <laughs> the whole thing, and it's this. Lock up your daughters, lock up your groceries too. White people coming through. <laughs> so what we have is a, is a sort of time-space clash. A time-space clash. Now Champlain notes that there's this, the, 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 the power of it. Here's what he said. We passed a fall, a league from here, which is half a league broad and has a descent of six or seven fathoms. There are many little islands, which are, however, nothing more than rough and dangerous rocks, covered with a poor sort of brushwood. The water falls in one place with such force upon a rock that it has hollowed out in the course of time a large and deep basin in which the water has a circular motion and forms large eddies in the middle so that the natives call it astiku, which signifies boiler, what we know now as the Chaudière Falls. This cataract produces such a noise in this basin that it's heard for more than two leagues. The savages, when pass the savages, les sauvages, the savages, when passing here, observe a ceremony which we shall speak of in its place. He's talking about the tobacco ceremony. Because as I mentioned, there is spirit within the falls. And in order to appease that spirit and keep yourself safe, they would give it tobacco. Now, they weren't growing tobacco up here. The, that tobacco was coming from down south. So they had obviously had quite a trade route. They also had copper, which must have come from around Duluth somewhere. So there's a whole trade route that's been set up. But what's Champlain actually trying to do with this? He's trying to get to the spice lands. The, the, the main spice being pepper that they were at. The, the French loved pepper. But what he does notice is that th they've, got th they've got these furs, which are uh, beaver furs, anik in, um, in Anishinaabeg. They're beaver furs. And he notices, A, they're very thick. Of course, they're waterproof. And they start a f the fur harvest. He can see that there's going to be a possibility of sending these furs back to France. And in fact, there was. There was a craze of beaver hats, a bit like, uh, a bit like the baseball cap. Now, there was this craze for them. Because in the winter, these things were superb, beaver hats now. It would be non-PC to wear them now, but then at the time, perfectly, perfectly fine. So that's the beginning of the, uh, the, fur, the fur trade. He's noticing this. Um, the other thing that he's doing, oh yeah, by the way, <laughs> forgive me for this, but if you think about it, the Europeans first of all came up, the Basques came over for fish, then Champlain and the beginning of the fur trade, and then later on the forest, the timber trade. So those all begin with F. So you could say that the Europeans effed uh, Canada. <laughs> I don't know if they'll leave that in for TV. <laughs> Did you miss an episode? Then go to rogerstv.com and watch The History of Ottawa According to Phil Jenkins online anytime. Thanks for watching.